And so I'm checking out Alexander Bromley's channel, of which he likes to poke fun at Coach Greg. He says that harder than last time, it's a bad idea. Guys, we got some online controversy I got to get to the bottom of. I got called out by two pretty well-known people in the lifting space, Greg Doucette and Paul Carter. And we got to get to the bottom of this because they did not like my volume is king video, but this is a hill I'm going to die on. So let's see what we figure out. Real quick though, check out barbellapparel.com slash Alexander Bromley. Not only do they put out the best training gear on the market, but that is where you can find my Brick by Brick and Strength Conquerors t-shirts. Real proud of how these designs came out and hopefully we'll have more designs in the future. So check those out. The first one I want to get to is Paul Carter because Paul's kind of a weird case. I've been following Paul for like 15 years. I used to be on his Facebook page in the comments when he was getting into these bridge burning meltdowns over absolute minutia. I would read his blog, Lift, Run, Bang. I bought some of his books. So I was especially surprised to find him lurking in my comments on the Volume is King video. Now, I assume that this is Paul Carter's account, has about 750 subs. It's just about four or five videos on his account of him doing uh, isolation movements in the gym. It seems legit. If it's not him, if it's like a dummy account or a fake account, then somebody must have prompted chat GPT to read all of Lift Run Bang and then make a comment in the style of Lift Run Bang, just with a little more Paul Carter at it. So this is what Paul Carter thought of my video. My head hurt watching this because it's clear you've not spent time really digging deep into how volume works or doesn't work in reference to rest periods. I suggest you actually spend some time looking at that rather than using some anecdotes that don't mean anything. Here, I'll help you out. It's been documented really well that around six sets for a muscle in a workout will basically max out myofibril protein synthesis when longer rest periods are taken. There's a lot more, but this whole thing was full of bad information. A for effort, I guess. Now you would think somebody who's been around as long as he has, who's kind of an ambassador of the sport, would see another sizable growing channel, see something that they think is wrong, incorrect, or maybe stupid, and offer an olive branch, maybe explain why it's wrong, go into a little more depth that might help unmuddy the waters in the future. But instead he takes the opportunity to stand on a soapbox angle the megaphone down and tell the people directly in his line of sight how stupid they are. Now, it's not really that he said this in a shitty tone that I took issue with. It took me a little while to figure out why this bothered me. And it wasn't until I went back and read some of his books that I had gotten quite a while ago that I figured out why. It's because Paul has completely changed his mind on just about everything with regards to training. When I followed him, he was in his powerlifting arc. He was big as shit, 280 or 290. He had like a 725 deadlift, a 365 behind the neck press. He was a big, strong, jacked motherfucker. And all of the things he said about training were rooted in pragmatism. It was practical information. He kind of turned his nose up at the evidence-based community. He really appealed to what the greats had been doing for so long. This works because because I've been doing this for 25 years, which he put like 8,000 times in all of his books. It works because this is what the greats did. It works because there's no reason to think it doesn't work. And oh, by the way, you're stupid if you try to overcomplicate it. Now, as annoying as his disappointed freshman football coach affectation can kind of get after a while, it is warranted sometimes. I think it's part of his branding. Let's refer to Lift Run Bang 365. Reps build mass, period. After more than 20 years of doing this and training people and looking at all of the anecdotal evidence, I don't think it can be argued that reps are where it's at for mass gain. I don't care about scientific studies that say this or that about how muscles respond equally to doubles just the same way as sets of 12, blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. Bodybuilders are the kings at building mass and they live on reps. We can even look at the old school powerlifters who are also mass monsters and they too spent the majority of their training doing sets of five to 10. So the important thing here is that he flat out says he doesn't give a rat's ass about scientific studies and he appeals directly to anecdote. It's not even his anecdote. It's not even this high level lifter that mentored me. It's not even my experience or the people I coach. It's saying generally bodybuilders do this. Generally old school lifters do this and that's good enough for me. So that by itself is quite a 180. Now I think this is warranted because in this field, anecdote like that is actually a bit more relevant and useful than the studies themselves because the studies can't support really firm conclusions. And if you listen to a Schoenfeld, a Krieger, and Eric Helms talk, they will speak exponentially more measured than Paul will because they are actual researchers. Their job is to represent the evidence to the best of their ability. And that means being very, very fucking clear about what is missing. Scientific evidence research is limited because there's just so many things that aren't studied. I'll give the same program 
program to a group of people and some will gain almost nothing and some are gaining 20% increase in muscle. So yeah. what we report in research are the averages. You're not an average. Everyone needs to be their own experiment. Paul, on the other hand, will pack the holes with his anecdote, which you have to do to be able to have really firm conclusions. You have to take your best guesses off of what you know, but he does it while simultaneously trying to make it seem like he is the only objective person that is upholding the evidence uh, to the highest standard and is being the most skeptical and the most measured when he's being anything but. Like I have a really hard time imagining that all of the other PhDs in like exercise physiology would stand behind Paul while he goes on one of his rants, spamming the clown emojis and have their hands on their hips and just say, yeah, you better listen to Paul on this one. He's got it right because they don't, they don't say one thing about the evidence without saying what all of the pitfalls are and repeatedly why you can't look at the evidence as a means of informing your training. It is explicitly not for that. There's a sense that people can bestow upon themselves a PhD if they just spend enough time on Google Scholar and it absolutely doesn't work that way. You need to be in the field going through the study, being slapped on the wrist by your professor because you weren't rigorous enough in pointing out your sources of error. You need to conduct these studies in order to see exactly what their limitations are. And although you might think that you've done that thoroughly enough by just pouring over study after study after study, Instead, what people end up doing is cherry picking, letting their biases kind of dictate where they're going. And if you're not actively part of a field that is constantly checking itself, whether you know it or not, you're going to be given to your personal biases. Paul has a big fucking ego and he makes a lot of money by being the guy that tells people what's what. And being outside of the field where all of those checks and balances exist, that's a fucking problem. So I'm happy to take Paul's anecdotes and his personal experience. I'm not happy to listen to him as if he is somehow the authority on how to interpret this body of work. And also as somebody who is formerly a follower of Paul Carter's, I'm about to get a personal injury attorney on the line so I can file a class action lawsuit for the fucking whiplash I got from Paul Carter changing his beliefs on just about everything midstream and acting like nothing fucking happened. From base building. Another central component of base building is that of rest periods between sets. This is an often overlooked principle in training, mainly because lots of guys like to take their time between sets and only go when they feel fully recovered. I cannot figure out for the life of me why guys want to rest between sets for so long. I'm in the gym to work, not check my phone or talk or sit around until I feel recovered, in quotes, for my next set. I mean, seriously, we're not talking about sets of 15, 20, 30 reps. We're talking about some doubles, fives, or eights. This should not put you down for such an extended period unless you're just a sad sack of shit conditioning-wise. The more work you can get done in the gym in an appropriate time, the stronger you will get. Now, I actually agree with this. I think this is good advice. He's talking about density here, which is a relevant component. It is something that you can adjust, increase, manipulate to get stronger. As density increases, you also increase. It's a tenet of strongman. We always have to train for doing uh, AMRAPs on the minute and we have to fill out the minutes. So that's a density component. We're not just going to failure and then stopping. So I actually think this is viable. I actually think what Paul preaches now is viable taking longer rest periods and getting more out of each set so that your training is a little more abbreviated and more efficient. I've trained that way. I've trained this way. They both have their place. What I don't get is why he speaks so fucking aggressively in both scenarios as if each one is the only way that you should be training. In both scenarios, he wags his finger at the reader and tells them how fucking stupid they are. And here he even calls you a sad sack of shit conditioning wise if you can't handle the rest periods. Now I could be really charitable and say that Paul has two distinctly different worldviews when it comes to hypertrophy for the sake of it, which by the way is like a niche within a niche. Like more people are worried about the overlap and actually care about strength. But in Paul's little corner of the world right now, I could be charitable and say that he views that differently than general mass building for strength specifically. But that would be too charitable because one, it doesn't make any damn sense because powerlifters would benefit greatly from more efficient methods of building mass because they have so many other skills that they have to develop and uh, time spent with specific work. Also, Paul can get on my channel, take one look at me and realize, obviously this guy isn't here just for the aesthetics. So I really think he's just gotten eyeballs deep in the studies as a way of like rebranding himself. And I think he's just kind of turned tight on everything he said before, just because it's a little more current and it gives him this new way of yelling at people. So I still have to ask if he believes what he believes now, then why are these books still available? If everybody who disagrees with him is uneducated, who needs to look into the research, who is just a, a Philistine of a clown, then why are these books still available? on Amazon and on his website. He's still selling these without taking the time. It's a great opportunity to put out another edition, to revise this, to update it. Why hasn't he done it? He's still selling them. 
That seems a bit fucking hypocritical to me. And guys, I'm super proud to have Boost Camp as a primary sponsor of this channel. Not only is Boost Camp the easiest and most intuitive way to track your training and your progress, not only is it absolutely free to use, not only does it feature an immense library of some of your favorite programs, but it features an exclusive library of programs you will not find anywhere else. In fact, there's so much content there, I'm actually doing a series specifically dedicated to the programs that you will only find on Boost Camp. Stop what you're doing right now, click the link below, download Boost Camp. And guys, as I film this, this channel just hit 100,000 subs like five minutes ago, and that number would not have been possible without the support of sponsors like Boost Camp. Also in a recent interview with Sebastian Burka, Paul talked at length about how Dorian was always his guy, that he was a fan and Dorian was a thinking man's bodybuilder and he never really got the high volume bullshit when he was bodybuilding. And I go on to the mass component. So this is after his bodybuilding phase the first time around, now he's a big power lifter. I go to his mass training component and I pick it apart and it's, it's nothing like what he's advocating for now. I mean, if I look at just the chest and shoulder day, it's seven sets of incline press, five by 10 on dumbbell bench press, 12 sets just of chest pressing, a little more than six, don't you think? And then total in the week, there's 26 sets of compound pressing movements. The leg day, seven sets of front squats or squats, five, four, three, two, one, then one by eight to 15, followed by a 50% set after that into three by eight stiff leg deadlifts, four by 20 leg press, four by 20 lunges. That doesn't sound like a goddamn Dorian Yates workout to me. Then you look at his back workout, four by eight barbell rows to start out, five, four, three, two, one of weighted chins, five by five to 20, depending on your chin strength with body weight, shrugs, four by 20, close grip pull downs, three by eight. That is a lot of fucking volume for your back. Paul also went out of his way in base building to talk about Boris Shako, who's a big influence on me as well. And Shako's programming, although not hypertrophy specific, still leads to growth and has developed some of the best powerlifters of all time and has made him one of the best powerlifting coaches of all time. His style is Olympic lifting applied to powerlifting. Skill work, submaximal, far from failure, many, 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 many fucking sets. The total amount of work causes growth. It just does. So when I make statements about like doubling up volume, I'm talking about like those types of lifters. When you have an Olympic lifter, a power lifter in that model where it's all kind of lighter skill work, they come out and they just vastly increase the skill work they do. They fucking grow. Anybody who's gone through Shaco, who's like a, a standard power lifter, First of all, it sucks because it's monotonous and the fatigue is very different. But those who get on the other side, they move better, they're stronger, and they're bigger. For example, the incredibly successful Russian-based volume program created by Boris Shako has the trainees spend most of their time in their relative 68 to 72% intensity range. Yes, that low. It's all about technique, volume, and repeating movement patterns. So long story short, Paul leaves this dickhead comment it pisses me off. I'm thinking, what's my problem with this comment? And I'm like, oh yeah, Paul influenced me mainly by citing all of the other people that I was following in the industry that all kind of agreed on the same thing. So for Paul to do that shit and slide into my comments with his brand new brand of this is why you're fucking stupid as a lifter, it bothered me. So I'm happy that I went back, brushed up on my Paul Carter lore because I really think the more this happens, uh, the more exposure it should get. You know, people should talk about what their shortcomings are. Everybody should be fair game, even me. And I'm actually going to get into that with my Greg Doucette call out. So now that we got this, let's go to Greg Doucette. The Greg Doucette call out, I actually didn't mind because one, I didn't see it quite as, as being as hostile. I think Greg is more in tune with the character that he plays on TV. He's talked in interviews about how he plays into his, uh, his flamboyant side. His whole brand is kind of finding things to whine about, complain about, push back against, and it, it works for him. Also, Greg has so little to gain by mentioning me. He has almost 2 million subs. He knows that he's doing me a huge favor just by saying my name. And he mentioned my full name multiple times. He showed images of me lifting that kind of gave me credibility. He had the clip playing of me doing RDLs with 495 for like sets of five. And that would kind of push back against the average viewer who's going to be like, why would anybody listen to this fat shit ginger? Which is not an unfair thing to say at this point in my training career. So the fact that Greg didn't go that way, he mentioned me numerous times, and the things he pulled out weren't even really that harsh. So I actually think Greg's call out was kind of benevolent. So I want to talk about the things he did call out about the volume video and give my response to it. And so I'm checking out Alexander Bromley's channel, of which he likes to poke fun at Coach Greg. He says that harder than last time, it's a bad idea. Listen to me now so that I never have to repeat myself. If you take a lifter who is used to a certain amount of volume and you double up on that volume, they get cookbooks bigger. 
It's not a question, and I'm not asking for your opinion on it. You take any athlete in the world, professional bodybuilder, no matter who you are, and you double up on that volume, and they get bigger. And so as soon as I get done this video, I'm going to call up Chris Bumstead. I'm going to tell him, double up on your volume, because next year you're going to the open class. You're winning the open class, Mr. Olympia. At least that's what Alexander Bromley stated. And remember, he's highly educated, highly knowledgeable, has over 100,000 followers. And so everything he says, 100% right. Work One out. sentence, can I give you the perfect formula for muscle growth? Of course not. But if you gave me an hour to explain exactly how it works, why, when, and how to do it, of course it's going to work. And so I listened to your advice and how hard was that to find a hole in it? Double up on your reps, everyone putting on muscle? Of course not. You could have stated, well, work towards doubling up on your reps. And if you notice you're training too much volume, then of course, don't go beyond that. Try to find a different way to train harder. But instead you make a blanket statement. Of course, you're going to find a mistake. So there's a couple of things he talks about. He talks about the doubling up on the volume and really calls me out by taking it to an absurd level. Now I could say he's being uncharitable, but the thing is he wouldn't be able to be uncharitable if I had spoken clearly. And I think that's his point. He even says, when you speak in broad statements, it's going to sound stupid. And that's exactly what I did. Of course, I didn't mean literally double up on volume. If you're doing 20 sets, do 40. If you're doing 40, do 80, do 80. Everything has a cap. Everything has a practical cap. So if you're adding weight, linear progression, you don't do it infinitely, there's a practical cap. Similarly with volume, I've talked about this and written about it in all of my books. Uh, I talk about methods of increasing volume. I talk about um, you know what, what the kind of range that you would move into is. And that's all very important. I should have included it in that video and I didn't because I got carried away in my Paul Carter-ness. So I gotta take the L, Greg was actually right to call me out on that. And as I'm saying this, I'm kind of looking down the barrel of a shotgun that's like the ghost of Christmas future, like that shell that's staring me in the face. That's a Paul Carter that I could potentially be if I don't get my shit together. So I'm trying to work on it. If you're gonna do the thing where you stand on your soapbox and point at somebody and call them stupid and say, listen to me, I'm not asking for your opinion, blah, blah, blah. Very least, you have to speak as clearly as possible. And I didn't, I spoke hyperbolically and that was a fucking mistake. Also. You shouldn't really be doing that thing much anyways. I I feel like those in the field who are combating, let's say the biggest idiots around. Let's say when you're arguing against flat earthers, you would think you're justified in just yelling at them and calling them fucking stupid. However, I kind of maintain that the best way forward is to represent your case the best way that you can, even to people that seem like they're off their rocker. So I will freely admit I am not doing that to the best of my ability. I have work to do on that front, but bear with me. You know, this whole thing's a work in progress. So yeah, uh, Greg was right to call me out on that. I got to take the L. Now he also pointed out the 26 sets thing. And so you can go all out balls to the wall, your first set to failure, and then do 25 sets more on one workout. Last I checked, 25 plus one makes 26 sets. And that is in fact higher than the 10 to 20 stated in the scientific literature. You are stating that it's not a question. It's not up for debate that everyone in the world can double up on their volume and will grow more muscle. Then you follow that up with saying you can do one all out set to failure and then add in 25 sets extra of seven exercises for a total of 26 total sets. And that that's going to put on muscle and that tons of bodybuilders do this. I don't know any, I don't know a single bodybuilder doing 26 sets in his workout for any given body part. Uh, I thought I was living on planet earth where everybody does two to three muscle groups in a workout, which is not uncommon whatsoever. Uh, you're still talking about work in that range. He was talking about that the evidence supports between 10 to 20 working sets. However, there are people that do train that many uh, working sets. I wasn't telling people to go do 26 sets of biceps, spread it between your other stuff and taking that work to a level of high intensity is harder than just high intensity by itself. That was the point I was making. A lot of bodybuilders will do 26 sets in a workout and they will be to or beyond failure on a lot of the sets. You could argue and say that's not optimal and that's fine, but they do it nonetheless. And on that note, since we are talking about amounts of work and how it correlates to better results, there absolutely is a precedent for the most competitive doing more and more and more work to be able to elbow out the other guys. I was talking about, um, that absurdist point that uh, people will get to, like high intensity guys, like volume so good, why don't you just do like a hundred sets of everything? Well, there's a practical cap. Like I said, 
with people, you have to balance stress versus recovery. And as any stressor, no matter what it is, climbs, you're going to interfere with recovery. It's going to be a bad time. Where that is, it's up for debate, probably some variability there. But there is the fact that people take time to adapt to volume and become able to handle a fuck ton of work and get a good result. I remember Jesse Miranda talked about adapting to a crazy amount of volume so he could do his strongman stuff, his Olympic lifts, and some of the capacity work. He got that, I believe, from Pujanowski. I know that Pujanowski influenced Miranda a bit. And Pujanowski said he did eight-hour workouts to get all the strongman work in, to get all the strength work in, to get all the capacity work in. Pujanowski was an absolute effing beast. Bill Kazmaier similarly said he would do like up to 70 working sets in a workout. And that's kind of side by side with the Bulgarian system. You have this tiny little country that was able to get Olympic medals because they took the talent they had and threw them against the wall. And the ones that survived maxing out three times a day, six days a week became world champions. Is this ideal? No, most people aren't going to survive it. That's why it's not appropriate for most people. And I'm not telling people to do that. I'm simply saying where it's able to be done, there is a precedent that doing more work over time correlates to better results. That's the point. So that's my response to the online drama. Hopefully we don't have to do one of these again anytime soon. I do like the, the pushback, the back and forth. I think it's important. However, when we're behind a camera or behind a keyboard on Twitter or TikTok or Facebook, it's easy for this to devolve into a shit show and people end up talking over each other's heads and it's not super productive. So I do like the idea of the discourse back and forth. However, it's often not the best version of us as ambassadors of the field. So anyways, let me know what you guys thought. Let me know if you saw these comments. Let me know if you saw Greg Doucette's video, what you thought about it, leave it in the comments. Better yet, take it to Patreon. That's where I upload my training weekly. That's where I answer questions, give form checks. That's where I give life advice. So anything you want from me, if you wanna get in touch with me, take it to Patreon. Thank you so much guys for watching. Until next time, this is Bromley, I'll see ya.